okay. I, um, in the meantime, Sushila, it's okay if I read some messages. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. So, <laughs> so we have Fasalisa from the Embassy of Ireland in Tanzania. Uh, we have uh, Thai says Vincent Guinea from uh, he's a climate resilience advisor from the UK, FCDO based in Glasgow in Scotland. Neatly warm and sunny here today. Uh, this was my message. I'm Gabriela Cáceres from Goal. I, I'm Honduran, but based in Mexico City. And today is a cloudy day. Looking forward to learn with you in the session. We have Sharon Kibor from Christine Aid in Kenya, joining from Arsavit town. Uh, we have Sydney. I'm based in South Africa and with the Adaptation Research Alliance. It's Misty and Drisley here today. We have, hello everyone, my name is Gloria. I'm Mexican and I'm living in England. So hello from Mexico City. I am PhD researcher. The weather is lovely today, warm and sunny. I hope everyone is doing great and can join the session. Um, hello everyone, I am Anupama from Mercy Court and Nepal. And we have Saroj uh, Katakur from Mercy Court, Nepal. Um, greetings from Nepal. Uh, I am Hasta, working in Mercy Court, Nepal. Great to be here. We have Shilal, who's obviously presenting with us today. Uh, we have Sanjita from Nepal, working for, uh, with Mercy Corps uh, in managing risk through economic development. Um, we have Kilembe, vulnerability advisors in the Embassy of Ireland in Lilongwe, Malawi. Um, we have Manan Peria from IDE, Nepal. Glad to be with all of you in this session. Mal Hebe um, from Conservation South Africa. Um, we have Ido based in Netherlands. Oh, I guess I know Ido. I am from the Care Climate Change and Resilience Platform. Confirm Ido, is, is that you, the same Ido that I met in, in this year in January? Uh, this is Saineem Sahib you, from Pakistan. <laughs> okay, yeah. thanks, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone and uh, thanks Gabriela. Uh, it's already like 42 participants and we are already like five, seven minutes ahead of the time. So we want to go and start right away. Uh, please drop your name and your organization on the chat box. We are looking through it to introduce yourself. So let me start with the basic housekeeping. Uh, this meeting is recorded uh, uh, by IIED and some part of uh, it will be made available in the website and we have to, uh, we request everyone uh, to discourage uh, to share the link of this meeting on the social uh, media because uh, this is the main source of zoom bombing and uh, we are taking security precautions to discourage uninvited participants. If you notice such uh, content, please notify the host via the chat function and we will remove them uh, immediately. For the best meeting experience, please close all the non essential applications on your device like Skype or Teams. Uh, I think you are all aware of the Zoom and these icons already. We have been going through this for whole three days on the session, but let me quickly run through this to you. Uh, you have this unmute button. We request you to unmute yourself throughout the session. And in breakout group session, we encourage you to open your mic and speak. And if the host requests you to open it and share some uh, observations, you can open it. But we request you to open your video for the live experience. And if the bandwidth is not supporting you, please uh, uh, off your video so that the bandwidth will support uh, the audio as well. You can see the participant icon and you can interact with the host using the icon at the button and the chat function is enabled for this meeting so we encourage you we highly encourage you to ask questions share your observations from the session in the chat box and we will be monitoring the chat box regularly and responding to the chat box uh, share screen and recording is uh, disabled for the participant for this meeting but we encourage you to give reactions to the presentation when it's happening to encourage our uh, uh, presenters and if you want to rename yourself you can go to the participants go to the select more mode and then rename uh, we encourage you to write your name and your organization so that it's clear to see who are joining with us and who uh, from which organization as well so that's from my side and i want to pass the today's session of multiple tools and resilience measurement uh, to Chet. Over to you, Chet. Thank 
Thank you, Susila. Hi, everyone, and welcome again. Uh, thank you for joining us in the community-based adaptation uh, CVA 15 forum session on peer-to-peer -peer training on res measuring resilience. My name is Chet Tamang, and I am working as a regional program director for managing risks for economic development program. This is a multi-country regional flagship program in Mexico, and I'll be here uh, today as a technical facilitator. So we have we have two different organizations who have invested almost a decade in unpacking the complexity of resilience and, and how we measure it. So we have Gabriela from Goal and, and Sri Lal from Mercy Corps presenting today. So why we are here and what uh, you can expect to hear in this session today. Uh, this session will be jointly hosted by Goal and Mercy Corps. Before we go into how we measure resilience, We'll start with the concept of resilience, uh, which will be followed by the presentation from uh, Goal and Mercy Corps. Uh, each organization will walk you through the tools that they have applied for resilience measurement. I would also suggest all participants uh, to keep noting few things during the measurement tools presentation, particularly uh, what is the guiding framework that uh, this organization have used for resilience measurement? Uh, in what context those tools were applied and at what level those tool, tools were applied. Uh, this will also help uh, at the end during the breakout session where we will discuss about the factors to be considered while selecting the tools or approaches. We are not uh, promoting our tools. Our intention is to provide a framework that would help to make decisions about selecting right type of resilience measurement tools. Um, it is important to, to understand the uh, uniqueness of a program context and the purpose of measurement that will ultimately help us to uh, right size the measurement tools and methods for our program and context. Um, otherwise, um, unpacking complex resilience uh, will be a bit challenging. We have a lot of, I can see a lot of uh, uh, people, almost the room is uh, full, who, uh, which is also an indication that there is a genuine interest um, to understand the complex resilience and its measurement. Uh, but I would also like to say that uh, let's not overthink. Uh, resilience is, is not complex uh, as you might be thinking, uh, but also it's not an easy concept as well. Uh, but most of the time what we have seen is it's, uh, um, it's us who, who makes it complicated. We'll, we'll try to try our best to uh, provide the clarity as well. So let's uh, get started and spend some time unpacking what resilience means. So what is resilience? So uh, we'd like to hear from you first. Uh, we'll use the Mentimeter to capture your understanding. Uh, you're allowed to use maximum three words uh, that defines resilience. So we'll for, please visit menti.com and uh, use passcode, uh, so the, the link and passcode, uh, you can find it in, in chat box. Yeah, please click on the link. Yeah, I don't see any response coming out. Um, let us know if there you have difficulty accessing. Oh, now it's coming, yeah. Well, capacity, transformation. Empowerment, adaptation, transformation, ability to respond. Yeah, the capacity transformation and adaptation looks like that's the word being repeated. 
mostly. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, there are more responses coming up, um, but I think um, this is fine uh, for now. So some of the few, few words that was coming up was related to capacities, um, ability, transformation. So I think, yeah, uh, there is a good understanding about resilience uh, already in this room. Um, okay, so we'll go through, we'll, we'll go through what, how we have defined resilience uh, uh, in goal or Mercy Corps. Uh, and some will also look at some of other organization definition as well. So in an ideal situation, uh, as a result of a development program, we expect the well-being of our program participant um, or target groups or community to increase over time. Uh, but this is not what we see in the reality. Uh, those who are exposed to multiple shock and stresses, uh, particularly the most vulnerable, uh, gets affected by shock and stresses time and again uh, as a result of inequality or poor access to resources the vulnerable group fail to bounce back or recover that makes them more vulnerable to next shock Ulti ultimately they get pushed into a vicious spiral of poverty so how to prevent that then how to make sure that the individual household or the communities uh, are not using the negative coping strategies uh, or compromising their well-being that makes it uh, difficult for them to recover or bounce back after the shock. So this is where the resilience come. Um, so what is resilience? Let's walk through some of the definitions. So there are various definitions um, of resilience. The one in the slide is just from a three different organization, VNDRR, uh, Mercy Corps, and, and Goal. And your organization might have your own definition as well, uh, de depending on uh, which organization you are uh, representing or where you stand, uh, whether it's an uh, individual household, community or institutions, the definition of resilience might be different for, for each of you. But uh, there should be a common framework uh, that defines resilience and use that framework to contextualize the definition as per your need. So we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. Um, but let's, let's go through some of these definitions that we see um, provided by some, some organization. From the United uh, UNDRR, um, they define resilience as the ability of a system, community, or society exposed to hazard to resist, absorb, um, accommodate, adapt to, transform, and recover from the effect of hazard in a timely and efficient manner, um, including through the preservation or restoration of the essential basic structure and functions through risk management. Uh, similarly, in Mercy Corps, uh, resilience is defined as the capacity of the community in the social ecological um, uh, system to learn, cope, adapt, and transform in the face of shock and stresses. Uh, and in goal, it is defined as the ability of community and household living within the complex system to anticipate and adapt to risk and to absorb, respond, and recover from shock and stresses in a timely and effective manner without compromising their long-term prospect and ultimately improving their well-being. So these were the three definition. Um, maybe uh, what I would like to request you is look at this three definition and uh, jot down some of the similarities that you find common um, in the, the definition that's used by these three uh, different organization. So uh, uh, I would like to request you to put your response in the chat box. Yeah, the question is, what are the common elements or what are the similarities that you see uh, common between the, the three definitions um, that we, we just went through? What do you find similarities? 
capacity, shock and stress, adapt, adapt, adaptation, shock and stress, capacity, complex situation, capacity to adapt, yeah, shock and stresses, extreme situations, adaptive capacity, capacity or ability, adapt and transform people's well-being, right? A, a lot of capacity is being repeated. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks everyone for your for your response. So we saw a lot of uh, common um, word in any other organizations where who have defined resilience. We we see some of these common words coming up, like uh, even in uh, and we have in common what we have found is we we've seen like communities or households uh, being clearly defined. It includes the resilience is defines also includes the system. It includes the capacity. When it comes to capacity, then it uh, we see a lot of anti uh, repetition uh, coming up about anticipation, adapt, adapt and transform, and it also talks about the the shock and the stresses. So uh, there are five resilience questions um, that we um, that we use to understand each of these elements uh, that helps us to define resilience for a particular program or context. You know, it could mean, I mean, it could sense, uh, depending on the context, uh, we can define resilience uh, to that context, uh, con context is specific. So what are those four, five resilience questions uh, that we use? Uh, so the four, first one is for whom, uh, which indicates the vulnerable group. Who are the most vulnerable? Um, whether it's an individual or a vulnerable household or the vulnerable community. There is the second one is about the system of what? Of what uh, we have, we want to understand the system that the, uh, the target group relies, uh, which could be social, economic, or ecological system. The third question to what? Uh, what type of shock and stress? that affects the people or the system that they rely on. And the fourth one, the through what, which, which is about the capacities that's required to reduce the exposure and sensitivity of the most vulnerable. And finally, the well-being. Um, this is about, uh, and we define this um, in a spectrum. Let's go to uh, another slide where we will uh, explain a bit more. So uh, why we use these five questions uh, to understand resilience is resilience could mean anything. So we have to, and we use these five questions to define the boundaries. Um, and, um, and this is just an example of using resilience questions in a, in a graphical form. Uh, this is the resilience framework that Mercy Corps have applied globally as a guide uh, to design, implement, and measure resilience. Uh, both Mercy Corps and Goal uh, Resilience Approach is guided by the same principle and, and, and we use similar resilience questions too. Hence the, the graphical representation is a less of a concern as the overarching framework is the same. That's why we are here together uh, facilitating the session. So as you can see in this um, uh, graphics, that there are all these five questions. Um, which should ultimately uh, um, result into a better well-being, as it was highlighted in the resilience definition as well. And you can, the, on the right side, you can see the well-being being uh, presented in in a spectrum, uh, which is uh, you know household or a community may be may totally collapse or nothing may happen, which which depends on the ability of household or a community to access and use the capacity that we build through our program. Uh, but anyway, and to understand the resilience uh, better, we use these five questions um, to define our boundaries, to define the resilience in our contracts. So next. 
So what is and what isn't uh, resilience? So resilience framework um, can be applied in any program or, uh, or any context. Uh, it isn't a, a end goal. It is a mean to an end, uh, a process that demands the systemic approach in designing, implementing, and measure, measuring the resilience so that the program or interventions are risk informed and the development gain isn't compromised as a result of shock and stress. Um, similarly, resilience program design starts uh, with building a good understanding uh, of a system. With a siloed approach, building resilience will be incomplete. Uh, with system approach, we also have to embrace the uncertainty that comes with it as we cannot understand the system fully. Uh, we can uh, look beyond, uh, we can understand the system in, a, in an incremental way, which is possible by building a very good m and system that looks beyond the conventional uh, baseline or end line of course, that informs the shift or uh, the pivots that we have to make uh, in our program approach or strategies because of a, of a change in the context or change in a different shock and stresses that affects the, uh, our target group. Next. Uh, so this is just to share what else uh, exists outside. There are various tools being developed and applied by different organizations to re measure resilience at different level. Uh, could be at an individual, household, community, system, or even at a country level. Uh, and depending on the need of the program, the context, and how we want to use those information, um, uh, you can choose or adapt the tools that fits to your need. Uh, this is a good transition uh, to our next um, discussion about the resilience measurement. Uh, please uh, observe closely how two different organizations have applied the resilience measurement framework uh, to design their me measurement tools, the way they have defined the system, the way they have defined the capacities. Uh, both Mercy Corps and Goal have been applying this tool um, uh, at a household community level and a system level. But for this training sessions, we will be only focusing at the community level. And just in case you are interested um, on how we use uh, or measure or apply some of these tools at other level, yeah, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us after the session. Okay, next. So before we start the presentation on the tool from two organizations, here's the quick uh, brainstorming sessions. So we'd like you to go through, go to menti.com again and uh, put your response to the questions. Uh, what would you consider when you are measuring resilience at the community level? So you can find the link uh, and, and the code in the chat box. So I'm, I would like to repeat again. So what do you need to consider when you are measuring resilience? at community level. We've discussed about what, what is resilience. Uh, so when it comes to resilience measurement, so what we need to consider, and we are saying uh, at the community level. So we need to understand about the context, livelihood, uh, what is the requirement of donor, uh, our community context, a context is getting repeated, uh, yeah, we need to understand what are, what are the different type of shock and stresses. We need to be aware about the social structure, what type of vulnerability that exists in the community. Uh, we also uh, be, should be aware about the social, cultural, and uh, economic context as, as well. Uh, yeah, definitely the well-being outcomes, uh, very good point, uh, what we want to achieve. Yeah, what changes do we want to see as a result of our program? What well-being outcomes? Uh, the power dimension, scale capacities, what type of risk, uh, so SDI, how decisions are made and what social structure exists and how inclusive are those? Uh, impacts on different social groups, uh, need to also look at the baseline. Vulnerability, 
Okay. Okay, great. Um, I think thank you. Thank, thanks everyone for, for your uh, for your response. Um, yeah, I think we will be touching on some of those um, during our presentation um, measurement tool presentation from the two uh, presenters we have. So, so we'll start that, but please feel free to drop your question in a chat box. We will pick one, uh, some of them uh, after we are done with the presentation. So we'll start uh, with Gabriela uh, from Gold. Uh, Gabriela, yes. please introduce yourself and proceed with the presentation. Floor is yours, thank you. Thank you. My, now I'm presenting screen, right? Yeah. So you're seeing the full screen, right? Yep. Yes, okay, Gabriela. thank you. Thank you, Ted. So welcome everyone. I'm Gabriela Caceres um, from Go. Uh, let's turn on the video, sorry. <laughs> I'm Gabriela Caceres from Go. From, I'm collaborating in the Resilience Innovation and Learning Hub um, of Go. So nice to have you here. So let me introduce you, briefly introduce you to the analysis of the resilience of communities uh, to disasters, um, RD Toolkit. So the RD Toolkit was originally published uh, by Goal in 2014 um, and sets out a practical approach to measure resilience at community level. Um, the Arctic Toolkit is built on the disaster resilience work commissioned by DFID, a uh, funded interinstitutional group um, in a publication named Characteristics of uh, Disaster Resilient Communities, and this was developed by Dr. John Twig. So the toolkit is built on that work, but also it was informed by a number of consultation with technical and political stakeholders during a two-year field testing process that, we took, that took place in 11 countries and across three continents. Um, after that process, uh, the RD toolkit was updated and enhanced and was uh, published again in 2016. And uh, this toolkit is available since then in French, Spanish, and English. So the RD toolkit, since its first uh, publication in 2014, it, it has been applied in 16, in, in a little bit more than 16 countries around the world. Um, and it was uh, featured in the 2015 e European Union Compendium on Resilience. And that same year, the RB Toolkit was um, institutionalized as a nationwide best practice uh, tool in Honduras uh, by the National Disaster Risk Management Authority at that moment. Uh, since then, we have applied the RD in more than 260 uh, assessments. Um, I, either in urban, but also in, in rural um, context. And more than 100 of these assessments are available in Goals Resilience Nexus website. I'll, I'll share the link later on. Um, and based on all these experiences and work done, we were able to develop and publish an academic article about the RD Toolkit. And this was made in close collaboration with Brand Corporation and the Harvard Humanitarian Institute. It was published last year. So how the RD works or how is it structured? So first, the RD Toolkit is structured in uh, 30 resilience, um, disaster resilience components, as you can see listed and at the right hand of the screen. And these components are organized uh, in the four priorities of the Sendai framework for action. We call them in the tool, we call them thematic areas. So we have four thematic areas um, that you can see on screen. Among the 30 resilience components that we have, I can mention, for example, uh, participative uh, community risk assessment, education of children um, in, on DRR, land use planning, um, community decision making, rights awareness and advocacy, sustainable environmental management, or health access and awareness, or hazard resistant livelihood practices, social protection, um, critical infrastructure resilience, contingency and recovery planning, early warning systems, and others. Um, so this 30 resilience components uh, will be studied or 
assessed against a chosen risk scenario, against one risk scenario uh, driven by a shock or hazard. These 30 components can be also organized in eight sectors or uh, sector of systems. Um, so as you can see on screen, there are a lot of numbers around this wheel. So we have like two components in terms of education or a number of components in terms of economic systems or environmental health infrastructure and so on. So the RT toolkit is a valuable or has been for goal, a valuable entry point uh, for systems analysis. So this means that the RD has helped us to do like a vital science test to uh, understand how are these critical, how are critical systems for communities resilience, how are these performing for them to identify those um, systems that are functioning well um, and that can be leveraged uh, for a better um, uh, resilience uh, or for a better status of communities resilience or to identify those um, systems that are dysfunctional or not working well and need, needs to be strengthened or transformed to really support communities' resilience. So the RD doesn't propose to replace um, tools for analyzing resilience at systems level, but to provide a holistic snapshot of the performance of these systems towards communities' resilience. Um, because we have learned, I mean, uh, and since uh, we have been applying the RD toolkit, that a number of these resilient components are outside our community's influence or our community's capacities. Because, um, and this is results because of um, legal or technical arrangements uh, or institutional arrangements uh, that are not in place and depends on higher administrative levels. Some examples could be early warning systems, land tenure, or health services, for example. So how the RD toolkit works? Well, the RD toolkit um, works in three main parts, like part A, part B, and then the analysis of information and so on. So part B, A, sorry, it's uh, basically analyzing and gathering data and trying to understand the general context of your community that it's being assessed. This is done by an RD team uh, with no least, we need at least two people working on this. Um, so these people will be, or this team will be doing key informants interviews, will be reviewing documents, plans, maps, reports, and all secondary data that is available. Um, they will be doing field visits in the community to do this direct observation. Um, to finally, the final product of part A, it's to identify the main shocks and stresses that are affecting or that can affect your community. Once we have done that, we analyze how these shocks and stresses interact or interrelate to conform risk scenarios. Then we try to understand these risk scenarios and we'll be uh, prioritizing this because we need to select at least one because against that risk scenario, we'll, we will be assessing the 30 resilience components, which are in part B. So once we have identified at least one risk scenario against which we will be assessing communi the community's resilience, we are ready to go to part B. So part B is about um, developing focus group discussions with community representatives to try to understand what's their resilience level against uh, the chosen risk scenario, the one that we have selected in part A. So here we assess the third resilience components uh, through a focus group discussions that will be led by uh, two facilitators. And this will take from three to four hours approximately. And we will need to have 12, at least 12 representatives from a community by each focus group developed. And the number of focus group developed will depend on your time and resources available and so on. Once we have done so, uh, we proceed to the analysis of the information, we prepare reports, and we give this back to our communities and stakeholders. What's more uh, in the RD toolkit is that it uses um, an open source data collection platform called ComCare. Um, and we use this uh, to collect data and then to host all this information in one single place um, in, in the cloud of the ComCare, but also uh, in dashboards on Power BI that we are 
able to share through the Resilience Nexus website. So the, the heart of the RD is part B, where the resilience assessment takes place. And as I was saying, this occurs uh, lead by two facilitators that will meet at least 12 representatives from the community. Um, so the guidance manual of the RD provides the technical sheet at the right hand. And um, these facilitators will be uh, developing uh, a simulating conversation that will be following uh, suggested guiding questions that we offer you in the guidance manual and in the technical sheet by each of the 30 components. And if they are doubting or they are not sure about the information, we offer you also uh, suggested means of verifications that you can ask in the moment or that you can consult after the discussion have taken place to confirm or to triangulate the information you have gathered during the discussion. Um, once you have done so, um, and, and, and you have understood the reality of your community, you will be able to do, or facilitators will be able to do an informed judgment of the community's resilience level by each of the 30 resilience components. So on screen, you're seeing component uh, one, which is participatory, participatory community risk assessments. So each of the 30 components uh, of resilience contains five potential um, disaster resilience level. One, which means uh, weak resilience and is worth one point, and it's the red um, square in the image. And then five, which means the strongest resilience level, and it's worth five points. The technical sheet offers you two types of uh, resilience level. The standard one, which is the, the colored one, and at the right hand, you will have a detailed description of what means to be in a level one, level two, level three, four, five, by each of the 30 components. So once you have done so, the sum of all the evaluated uh, components is the total score, score of the community's disaster resilience. Uh, so it is a holistic snapshot, uh, like a photograph of uh, the community disaster resilience status at the moment of the assessment. Um, so the RD toolkit offers uh, this scale of general um, level of, the, uh, of resilience. So if we got 54, as you can see on screen, um, it means we are in a low resilience level, which means uh, that the community have shown some awareness and motivation, some actions, but these actions are piecemeal and short term. If you are using a digital data gathering uh, platform like Comcare, uh, the results will appear automatically on your device screen. And these will go, uh, then it's exported onto an offline, this will go to the Comcar database, and then you will be able to export this into an offline Excel uh, sheet for further analysis or to connect these database with Power BI dashboards, uh, which are available for viewing in the Resilience Nexus website in the case of Go, because we are using this uh, platform. So what's all the fuss with the Resilience Nexus website that I've been mentioning so much? Well, this is a website created by Goal in 2018. And apart from sharing information and news and so on, it is designed basically to gather and display RD assessments, um, results applied around the, the world by any organization. It's not just for, for Goal. So it's open for everyone. Um, so... As you can see there, we have like a georeferenced assessments that you can see on, on the website and what's the results uh, among the different countries that have been uploading data and uh, the main and the core uh, graphic of the RT, it's the spider graph that you can see on screen. So let's see now a case study of this application. So the RV toolkit has been applied in a goals urban resilience program named Barrio Resiliente in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. And, and the RP was applied as part of the baseline that took place in 2013, as you can see on screen, and also as part of the end line that took place on 2018. So um, as you can see on the spider graph, uh, there, is, there, are, there are some components increase or the majority of them increase, not only because of the program intervention, but also due to other um, governments um, initiatives that took place at the same moment, but other uh, components uh, decreased. And these are, for example, uh, capacities in preparedness and response and early uh, recovery, 
uh, health services in emergencies and community decision making. The first one and the third one, which are about capacities in preparedness and response and community decision making, decreased because of internal leadership conflicts within these uh, uh, neighborhoods in Tegucigalpa. Um, and and, the, and the, the second one, health services in emergencies decreased because as a result of uh, school deterioration due to a geological fault in, in these communities. So based on this, we learn first that, you know, resilience is something, it's very dynamic in time. Um, due to lots of elements that we cannot uh, control, of course. Um, we learned that. And also we learned based on this uh, elements, our scores decrease, our components that decrease, that we needed to incorporate in our programming um, uh, conflict resolution activities, for example, um, to, to help communities to drive despite these conflicts um, in terms of leadership and so on. And then we understood that we needed to incorporate a system approach within the within our program means that we needed to adopt this approach to bring together all the permanent actors within the key systems that we identify um, in these neighborhoods. And this were, was social housing and drainage systems. So we learned that. And based on that, we rebuilt, we redesigned the program, which is now taking place, the second phase of this. Uh, program not only in Tegucigalpa but also in Colombia. So um, that's, that was a quick review. Now um, um, I would like to, well, and to conclude, sorry, um, we also have learned that not only that resilience is a very dynamic process uh, that takes it takes place, it's moving in, in a positive way or a negative way. Uh, it can change, obviously, if a, a shock, a shock uh, cures, and so on. Um, but we also learned that the RT toolkit was uh, useful, that it was adaptable uh, to different contexts or to measure different capacities. Um, and, and, and obviously that um, we, we, we will be able to see changes if communities, uh, if capacities uh, of communities change, but also if, 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 if capacities or contexts at higher levels were changing, like systems level or the context um, were changing. So uh, we, we needed to be, you know, taking a look at this um, to monitor what was happening in our, in our neighborhoods. Okay, so to conclude, we will do two short exercises, really short exercises to see, um, to, to explore uh, and to dig in and how this works. So don't, don't feel afraid. So first, According to the resilience level description on the components, um, let me, I don't know how I can use here. Okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, okay, so yes. So um, based on this component that we have on screen, um, I'm, I'm highlighting here, how would you score the resilience level of the community where you live right now? So read the levels. Um, can you launch the poll for me, Sushila? The first one. Okay, so according to those levels, according to your, sorry, ha, uh, your community where you live, how would you score the resilience level of the community where you live right now? Few more seconds. So the RT offers you two different ways, the, the, the standard resilience levels, which are colored on screen, and the detailed one. So the poll has a combination of two because we cannot put so many words. Okay, I'm gonna close the voting in a few seconds. Fifteen seconds. I close it. Okay. So I guess you can see. I'm gonna share results on screen. I guess you can see them. 
yeah so level one seven percent level two 14 percent level three medium level which is 66 percent level four seven percent and level five seven percent okay so great now we will move to the second exercise hold on hold on i cannot uh, hold on okay let's move to the second exercise so considering the scores you gave to your community in terms of community decision making based on your score before and according to the detailed description of this component in the in this technical sheet what actions would you promote to strengthen the resilience of your community so you can either write in the chat or yeah we don't have another poll right sushila i, I forgot it sorry no no um, you can write the jambo we have the jambo. okay uh, I can okay share thank the you Please, can you help me with that? Okay, so think about it. Based on the score you gave, please let us know what actions would you do? I'm gonna paste this in the chat, I guess I can. What actions would you do to increase your community's resilience? So, so Sheila, can you go for a second to to the to my slide, or I can share it so they can see the technical sheet. I'll, I'll do it, Sushila. One second. I can share. That. Okay. Let's okay. 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 There you go. Uh huh. So, taking into consideration the detailed description of the levels, which actions would you do too? To increase communities resilience. Great. Now we can see some answers. Increased capacity, information sharing, great. Um, community design of DRM plan and make visible funded, funded and report and regularly do long-term forecasting, develop and communicate strategic plan, develop measurements to assess processes, improve the economic situation of communities. Uh, to start would be basically creating awareness. We assume people understand what risks they face, but how can we measure this understanding? Dialogue with government, stakeholders, and other. Uh, increase accountability, of course. Increase early warning systems and communication participation and listen to citizens, make directory of representatives and ongoing programs, um, promoting climate resilience. And okay, so for now, I guess there are a lot of answers. So the point would be in terms of community decision making, specifically what um, initiatives or actions we should be doing. So lots of them were quite aligned and others were more broad, which is perfect. Um, but the, the point will be that you can use a technical sheet to take ideas of what actions specifically can be done to increase that uh, component, which was community decision making. So thank you so much. If you have questions or if you want more information, do please approach me through uh, Zoom or email. These are my contacts. And uh, let me know if you're interested to be trained on the RK Toolkit or other approaches of goal. Uh, just approach me. We have a training starting next week, an online training starting next week. So um, do please approach me if you, if you need something else or if you have any questions. So now I'm, I'm going to hand over to Shalal. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gabriela, for the wonderful presentation of RK Toolkit. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Srilal from Marsikur, Nepal. I will be presenting the DRM toolkit which Marsikur has designed and implemented in three different countries, Nepal, Indonesia, and Timor-Leste. Next. So before entering to the slides and content, of today's training session, I want to break the ice and want to discuss outside of the resilience. As we are aware uh, in this current COVID situation, 
we have been through the lockdown in many part of the world and most of us are staying at home working from home so in this situation you need to do all the basic household works by yourself right i think so okay uh, next so let's discuss on the skills that is needed uh, in our daily life we want to use menti to collect your experience while staying at home the question is already displayed on the screen please go to menti.com and enter the pass code can somebody drop the link on the chat box please yes cooking wow what is it meditation child care Whoa. I think, I guess, yeah, you enjoy it uh, in your daily work and those are the skills uh, which are already collected here. Some more skills. Okay. Uh, thank you for your uh, ideas uh, which are already uh, listed over here. So, uh, next slide. So, let's come back to the topic again on resilience. What we have told you, we will talk about community level resilience, toolkit from Mercy Court Nepal. Okay, uh, so uh, what is DRM toolkit? Like it reads, it is a tool for measuring disaster readiness of communities. So, uh, why do we use this toolkit? What is the use of it? We recommend to use this tool annually to find the current status of the communities or how disaster ready these communities are, which will also support in program decision making. And so it will be easy to plan next steps, ensuring these communities are disaster ready and planning for exit with sustainability. So uh, that we experienced. So as mentioned earlier that this is the standard resilience measurement toolkit and it is based on the community-based disaster risk management framework, which we say CBDRM framework too. As you see on the left side, CBDRM framework has outlined nine minimum characteristics which are especially focused on disaster risk reduction work. But through Mercy Corps practical experience, we realized that this is not enough. Yeah, so we integrated disaster risk reduction with livelihood incentives, uh, which is uh, displayed on the right side of the screen. And we say Nexus approach in our project. Yeah, the, the combination of both, we say Nexus approach. So the learning of Nexus approach uh, has shown the better outcomes in community level. So taking this learning and this experience, it has been prepared 10 characteristics of a resilient community. Yeah, those 10 characteristics are displayed on the screen. Uh, if you look at uh, one by one, uh, I'm not going uh, one by one uh, to all. So one of them uh, you can see is multi-hazard risk assessment. This should be done in community and another highlights that each household and individual should have the access to this information. For this, we applied a participatory disaster risk, risk, risk assessment, PDRA, we say PDRA tool in communities. Another characteristics, a functional preparedness and response mechanism should be in place. In our working area, uh, we we focus three different task forces, namely search and rescue, first aid, and early warning. We also promote emergency fund management in community 
for its functionality for better response uh, during disaster. So uh, for a resilient community, we realize that the need for continuation and replication of the activity for disaster readiness. Thus, we also have one characteristic focusing mainly on replication and learning. You can see on the screen. Yes, next. Okay, in the 10 characteristics, we have designed 65 sets of guiding questions. During designing the questions, uh, uh, we have considered multiple uh, levels, multiple lens to get more details. Just like uh, you can see uh, on the left side, community context and enabling context. Uh, some characteristics depend on the community themselves, their self-initiation and action in the community especially. But for some characteristics, support is needed by an enabling environment, mostly the supporting agencies like uh, local government. So we use the lens of community context and enabling context. Uh, likewise, um, during designing the guiding questions, the three phases which are displayed on the right side, uh, three phases of disaster management cycle, uh, just like before disaster or uh, preparedness phase, during disaster response phase, and after disaster recovery phase was also considered uh, to get insights. Yes. Likewise, uh, the spectrum of progression <coughs> sorry, was also considered while designing the questionnaire. The spectrum helps breaking certain characteristics or capacity into multiple pieces to understand progress or change than simply staying whether community has certain characteristics or does not have. The progression or change starts with awareness. If you look at that ladder, look at the <coughs> steps, uh, uh, it starts from awareness. After awareness, they should have access so that they trust the mechanism, which will lead to adoption and use of the same. This will enhance the confidence of the community thus leading to community and replication of the action. Uh, just for example, uh, I'm giving an example of early warning system. It is not only about they get early warning masses or not. We are also exploring, do the community have awareness of early warning system? Do they have access to this information? Do they trust the system? Are they using and adopting it? Are they confident about the system and its use for them? If only all these is achieved, we can see the continuity and replication of it, uh, which uh, is, has been shown uh, on the steps. Okay, next. Yes. Why are we using a multiple lens to designing the questionnaire and analyzing the data? Why? Uh, so as you know, uh, there are underlying causes and hidden gaps in the community. The multiple lens will help us to identify and pull out the gaps and challenges which are inside the community. Many of the changes will only come in the long run. And there might be very small changes, which can only be observed with this detailed lens analysis. And sometimes if small changes are celebrated, people will be motivated to add actions for stepping ahead. Yeah, that is our experience during implementing this tool. Next. Yes. Uh, during analyzing the data and the scoring mechanism used in our tool is a color band, which you can see uh, on the screen. Uh, we use red, yellow, and green for easy understanding 
in community level. The red is for low, yellow for medium, and green for high. And the green is also considered as on the path to resilience. Yes. Next. Yes. Uh, we analyze the data. And now, is it the end? No. Is it complete? No. What next then? Yes. Next slide. What we did after this, uh, before that, let's do uh, another exercise. So let's self-evaluate your skill on Menti again uh, with the three color as low, medium, and high. Uh, please go to menti.com and enter the passcode. So if you look at the question, the cooking, you have to evaluate yourself on the cooking, kitchen work, especially where you are. Please rate yourself. Yes, we can see the results. Red color is in low. So most of the participants are in medium level in cooking. It looks so, and uh, nearly more, yeah. Now, yellow goes up. Yeah. I think you are still voting. So uh, I think this is the final uh, score, final level where we are. The result shows uh, that most of us are in medium level for cooking skill. So now you can see here, if you look at the results, uh, that where you are and how much you need to improve in your life skill of cooking. That's what we did with DRM Toolkit score too in the communities. So we use the same scoring exercise for the communities with those colors. Yes, uh, in summary, this is the step what we did in the community from self-assessment to self-planning. After the assessment done by the community, the results were analyzed and we go back again to the community and ask them for self-evaluation using the color code. Then the result from the assessment and the self-evaluation was cross-matched uh, yeah, to find out uh, the gaps and challenges. This will trigger the discussion and community will realize where they are, which is characteristics, they are struggling, which area they are working very well and should be sustained. Thus, through that, to improve the well-being, they will start their self-planning. This will help the community to understand their own situation and design relevant, appropriate, and achievable actions. Next. Yes, with this, I complete my session. If you have any questions or queries, please drop it on chat box. And in Mercy Core, we believe that resilience is a pathway and not the end goal. Thank you, everyone. And over to you, Chet, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sri Lazi and, and Gabriela uh, for your presentation. So we have, we saw, we received some question in chat box. Uh, there were two questions. I think both of them has been answered um, in chat box, uh, but we can take some more questions if any of the participants have uh, regarding the presentation on tool from Mercy Core or Goal. Yeah. You can use chat functions or you can raise your hand.
Don't be shy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw Adel. Adel um, raised her hand. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Hi. Adel. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if you look at the different tools because you both presented them, what kind of uh, overlap do you see between the tools and what do you think you can learn from each other uh, based upon these different tools? Uh, thank you. Great question. I don't know, Shilal, would you like to go first or I do? <laughs> uh, you please start. Uh. Okay. Uh, well, we well we have seen that first uh, the DRM toolkit um, itself assesses uh, or has uh, instruments or tools to measure like the institutional context and 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 to gather specific elements or livelihoods. Right, Shilal? If, if I'm not lying, if I have learned yeah. from you, yeah. that's yeah. a key point which is a really good point. So for example, myself as goal, I'll be using the RG toolkit because I'm, a, I'm aware of it, I'm, I'm comfortable with it, but I'll be using uh, these other elements from the DRM, for example, because are not implicit, are not part of the RG toolkit. So I could be, you know, dig in more in those elements by using the DRM. Uh, but people from Mercy Corp, I would say, if I were you, Shrilad, for example, they could take a look at the RG toolkit, for example, and take a look to other elements that they might be missing, that, that might be not uh, precisely included in their um, in the ten elements that they are measuring, and and just incorporate few questions maybe uh, to assess those elements. Um, so I guess there is a lot of of elements that are common between the tools, but one key elements uh, are the contextual and the livelihoods uh, and tools that they use. And also, what would be, for example, what is the purpose uh, of measuring resilience? So if someone is trying, for example, I don't know, I'm thinking of a local government and they want to measure their progress in terms of the Sendai framework or something like that, they might say, okay, so this will help us to understand what's the resilience level by each of the Sendai framework priorities areas. So if that's their purpose, they might go for the RP toolkit, for example. So that should I can add to that. Totally that's my learning. Totally agree with you, Gabriela. Uh, I think, Tetsa, uh, do you want to add more? Mm. Uh, not from my side. Okay. There's a question in the chat. Uh, right now, Hayon. Sorry if I'm not saying her, I'm spelling the name correctly and says, how often should the assessment be repeated? And can the communities apply the tool by themselves after the first application? Great question. So for the RT toolkit, how often? We, in our experience, we have, I would say, not less than six months, because um, even if, if it's, it seems it's not a lot of work, it is because it's qualitative information so and focus group discussion, so, so it takes a little bit of time. So in my experience, I would suggest not less than six months. However, we have been through an experience where communities were hit by a shock. And so we were asked by the donor, we would like to understand what's their resilience level now. So we measure it. And as it was an emergency response, um, we agreed to measure resilience three months later or after they received the, the, uh, the, the emergency response. So we did that and we understood that resilience is quite dynamic. So we saw some changes, positive and negative changes, mainly in terms of social cohesion and social components of resilience. So... I mean, I would say it'll depend on the moment where you are measuring it, but if it's not after a crisis or during it, or, uh, I would say no, no least than six months could be exhausting. Um, and, but in the, in the case study I showed you before, we did it uh, in an annual basis and it worked uh, really good. So 
um, that was a good experience too. Shulan for the DRM. And if it can be used for communities, we haven't tested that yet. We made a try years ago, uh, and I know that community were, was able, but uh, we haven't spread this practice, unfortunately. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we have planned to do. Yeah. Trying to build like a short manual to explain these to communities. That's the plan. Thanks. Thanks, Gabriela. Yeah, um, yeah. As uh, we have uh, given some information about the contact person, yeah, please feel uh, free to reach out to um, individuals from the store organization if you want to learn more about the tools as well. So we have we're now moving into a breakout session. Um, the next slide. So uh, we are dividing all the participants into uh, three groups. So we have one household group another community group and another as a system or institutions. So in your group, uh, please discuss uh, what are the key factors uh, to be considered when you are making decisions about you know, choosing a tool or approach for resilience measurement. And also just a reminder, um, just to keep the discussion more focused and not to get diverted. Uh, you will be only discussing about the factor to be considered related to your group. For example, if you are in a household group, your discussion should focus on the factor to be considered uh, while, selecting, um, while selecting household level resilience measurement. So we're moving people into a group. Uh, once you're in the group, please discuss and select a speaker who will be who will summarize the key points from the discussion to a, a bigger group in main room. Um, and we have also three people who will be moderating this group. So for household group, Asmita, uh, for community, we have Srilal, and for system and institutions, we have Gabriela. Okay, so Sila, how we are now? Uh, uh, can you see the rooms? Uh, I have opened the room. Can you see the rooms? Can someone from the participants? Because I can see yes. them. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can. I can see the room. Mm, some people has already joined room one, two, and three. Uh, okay. The others, can you please join the room? There are still twenty-five people over here too. You have to select your room by yourself. So please do that. I uh, hope everyone is back to main room. Uh, now, as I uh, requested before, I hope you, ha you have assigned a speaker for each group um, to share the key points to the wider group. So let's just start from uh, household room. Uh, anyone assigned as a speaker from household room? Uh, I, I will be leading from the household group. Okay, go ahead, Nabin. Uh, so far with the, the household level of resiliency, our team of 11 discussed a lot of uh, like household resiliency items. So the team agreed on like uh, pointing out on the well-being of the household and uh, sensitivity of exposure of households, household items that are necessary at uh, household level and identification of the household level of hazards and uh, community profile identification, uh, as well as the um, capacity of the household access to the services and financial uh, management. These were the steps uh, uh, discussed uh, among our team uh, regarding uh, the identification of uh, the level of uh, resiliency measurement at the household level. So, in addition to the identification of the tools, uh, some of the, the tools were discussed among the, the participants of our group, such as Comcare as well as Kobo. Uh, so we, we didn't came up with like, what are the, the benefits or the demerits of using uh, these tools. So we just pointed out, uh, out uh, which tools can be used uh, 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 for the capturing of the information uh, at the uh, household level. Along with this, uh, some of the other modalities of the information collection uh, with the questionnaires, 
a focus group discussion among the, the group of the people uh, in that community along with key informant uh, interview uh, was also noted out by the participants. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Nagin. Yeah, I think it's, it's really important um, when we decide about the tools, then what we are going to measure about like the well-being, what are the type of well-being outcomes do we expect to see in that community? Uh, how does the vulnerability profile look uh, uh, looks into that community? What are the capacities that we are we aiming to build in that those communities? So I think understanding this helps to uh, really um, make a decision about what tools, what is the appropriate um, type of tools that we can deploy for household level resilience measurement. Thank you, Navin. So for second group you know, from the community uh, room. Uh, who wants to go? Anyone assigned as a speaker? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, it's going to be me. Uh, I'm Dinitma uh, uh, from Mexico. Now, uh, so uh, our community actually uh, didn't follow the questions. We were more uh, focused on sharing our experiences on using community-based uh, resilience measurement approaches. And it was interesting to see a very uh, variety of uh, experiences and approach being used. Uh, one of the participants shared about the ecosystem-based approach uh, of uh, implementation where uh, they were looking at the communities uh, and uh, trying to ensure that all of the communities had in common understanding of the definitions, trying to assess adaptive capacity, which was also reflected um, by um, uh, one of the participants from Nepal, Madan Sir, actually, uh, who shared his experience uh, working with Anukulan project and looking at the absorptive, adaptive, anticipatory ca capacities, and also looking at the access to resources, access to systems, and even people health status were explored. Uh, another interesting part was a uh, study of uh, not only the capacities, but also the perception like how people were perceiving it. So perceiving uh, the resilience or uh, their improvement. So that risk perception as well. So that was an interesting perspective. Um, someone from uh, also, some of, one of the participants also shared about the psychological uh, part of study, like the approach. Uh, that was an interesting part for us. Uh, somebody just added need uh, and resource assessment as well. Uh, so to summarize, uh, I would say uh, we were looking at these kind of things. Thank you. Thank you, Dini. Yeah, I think it, it highlights some, the interesting was ecosystem-based approach. I think uh, when we were talking about the resilience, then defining what the system is, and um, you know, depending on how you define your system, you can choose your tools also. So if there are like ecosystem-based tools or to measure, the resilience of ecosystem, that would be interesting to learn as well. Thank you. So we have a, a last group from system and institutions. Um, Gabriela, are you going or anyone? Ido and, and the rest will support her. She will share what we have discussed. We didn't follow exactly <laughs> the questions too. No, we first had a discussion uh, surrounding what does it mean what kind of system are we looking at? What does the system mean? Um, the differences between different kind of systems, for example, you have ecosystems, you have market systems, you have governance system, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you look at the different si systems? And then a uh, really great point was raised by uh, Ainka, uh, who mentioned um, that it would also be very important to see how the different systems relate to each other. And uh, whether it would be possible to have a multi-shock scenario uh, and how to uh, measure that. And Gabriella shared uh, some experiences related to um, the uh, resilience for social systems approach that she also shared in the chat. And I think she's better placed than I am to explain about that. Um, and please add to me, um, my uh, fellow participants in the breakout group, if I missed anything. There were, the conclusion was that there were a lot of questions raised, um, but that we didn't have that many answers yet. And that the time was kind of short, at least that's how I perceived it. And i um, curious to hear more about um, the resilience for social systems approach of um, goal. 
Yes, my experience is based on that uh, tool developed by Goal. So I have shared the link in the chat just in case, because here is no time for explanations about that or more explanation. But another key element that we mentioned in the team that I want to raise again uh, was, um, well, with that, before we start discussing about system resilience at systems level, we need to be clear what resilience means to us or to our context, right? And 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 how do we understand or define systems too, right? Um, just to to make sure that we are in the right pathway of um, selecting a tool or approach to understanding all of this or measuring all of this, and and the importance of understanding and measuring, right? of understanding the interdependency or um, interrelation between um, the different systems within a system, right? And Stefan or Ainka can correct me, but that was a key element that we raised in, in the group. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gabriela. Yeah, I wish uh, it was a very interesting discussion. I wish we had more time to talk about uh, the resilience and resilience measurement. Yeah, we are almost towards the end of the session. So uh, I'm wrapping up the session. So thanks everyone for your participation. It was a great learning experience from everyone. Um, as Gabriela, you, you were mentioning, you know, resilience could mean anything. So, uh, so how we, we, should, we should define what resilience means for us uh, first, and we can um, apply a resilience framework uh, as we were talking before about you know, there are in Goal and Mercy Core, we use this five different resilience questions that help us to define those boundary and define what really resilience uh, mean for us. And then after that, we can think about, okay, how we measure that resilience. And just to want to go through quickly about those five questions for whom, about the, who are our target groups, of what, what type of the system we are, um, these people are dependent on, to what type of different shock and stresses, through what? What are the capacities that the people uh, need uh, and to what end, which was about the well-being? What do we want to achieve at the end after building those capacity? Um, and, and, and also we have discussed a lot about the system and resilience approach. I think one, one of the distinctive thing of resilience approach is it requires a system approach, uh, looking at a different level, not, uh, you know, working only at a one level or community level is not enough. We have to look at the multiple level. So if we are working at the multi -level, multiple level, then how do we measure those uh, major resilience at the multiple level uh, as well? And resilience is also not a, a cross cutting uh, issue or, or thing. It's, it's an, it is an uh, overarching framework that guides the design and implementation and our measurement approach. Um, and also, you know, as, as the resilience takes the system approach, uh, its measurement has to be, as I said before, it has to be done at a, a different level. And maybe the, we have to move away from like a traditional baseline and line approach. But there are a lot of factors that could determine which tools or approach or what, at what level we should be focusing in our measurement. In, uh, uh, a program can uh, might be just focusing at the community or a household level, then um, maybe we can think of you know, simplifying the resilience measurement. So we only focus at the household or, or community level. But if the program is more working at a, a broader systems, then uh, a, a more complex, uh, more comprehensive tools might be required. Sometimes it also depends on the donor requirement. Um, you know, whether it's a required by donor or is that something we, that we want to do internally for our program so that we can adaptively manage our programs. Um, you know, the resilience measurement sometimes can be very complicated and, and expensive too. So um, it also depends on uh, what type of technical expertise, financial resource or human resources that we uh, have in our program. Um, as we have seen, you know, like both Goal and Mercy Corps has applied some same frameworks and principle. Uh, the purpose of um, the tools and the type of decisions what you know, we want to uh, make were a bit different, but like overarching framework were same. And the, ultimately, the purpose of both tools was to understand where communities stand at a point of time and, and what initiatives is, is required uh, so that they can move up in the spectrum. Uh, 
both uh, RD toolkit and DRM toolkit, um, um, they applied the, the resilience as a framework, but uh, RD toolkit, it provides a more holistic uh, snapshot of a community disaster resiliency status um, in two parts. Part A, assessing the general context of the community and in the part B, um, assess 30 resilience component uh, to a chosen risk scenario through a consensus-based focus group discussion. And at the end of the assessment, an indicative resiliency score was assigned. Uh, similarly, in DRM toolkit that's represented, it was based on 10 different um, community disaster ready elements that includes even the livelihood. So, uh, and it, uh, it, it focuses on the process of self-assessment, self-realization, uh, and, and self-planning to upgrade uh, the outcome in the community uh, and, and also at the institution uh, level. So I think with that, uh, I would uh, like to uh, thank everyone for joining this session. Uh, the resilience thinking is evolving. Uh, we are trying, everyone is trying to simplify and so as uh, the measurement um, approach as well. Um, as both of these organizations, they have invested uh, more than uh, you know, five, 10 years to, to develop this type of tools and simplify those tools. I hope this session was very useful for you to understand resilience and how we measure it. Um, uh, so as I said before, if you want to know more about this tool, please feel free to connect with us um, after the um, session as well. Thanks, uh, Gabriela and Srilal, for, for your presentation and everyone for your time. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you so much.